Now, we are campaigning as the Labour Party, the Labour Movement, unashamedly for Britain to remain in the European Union. Why, in essence? Because membership of the European Union has brought us jobs, investment, growth, security, and influence in the world. That is the argument in a nutshell. It's not a debate about whether everything in the European Union is perfect. It isn't. We want to see change. We've argued for it in the past. We want to see change in the future. But it is an absolutely fundamental choice about what will be best for the people of this country, our families, the jobs that we rely on, the communities that we are part of, and how we're going to work with our neighbours at the beginning of the 21st century to deal with the challenges that we face in the world. And our argument is very simply, we're seven, what, we're 7.2 billion people inhabiting this planet of ours. By the end of this century, we'll be about 11 billion. And either we're going to deal with the challenges we face, whether it is what we're seeing on our television screens as we speak, the refugee crisis in Europe, the conflict in Syria, that is forcing people from their homes. Um, mums and dads don't put their children into boats to take a perilous journey across the sea for any other reason than that they are desperate. And having been in October to visit uh, refugees from Syria in Jordan, people just like you and I, mums and dads and, and grandmothers, and we need to play our part in bringing conflict to an end. We also need to play our part in looking after people who are fleeing shelter. Because you know what? If it happened to us, that's what we want. And there is a common bond of humanity that we have got. But Europe also plays a part in ensuring our security. Now, here we are in Plymouth, which has played such an important part and continues to do so contributing to the security of the nation. And I started today at the wonderful Help for Heroes Centre, which was inspirational, I have to say. State-of-the-art facility, supporting those who have served in our armed forces, um, the RAF, and the Navy, and the Army. And I was incredibly impressed by what I saw and heard and had a chance to talk to some of the veterans about the difference that Help for Heroes and all of the other charities and organisations that support those who have served our country, some being physically injured, others injured in other ways, and we all need a helping hand. But if we think about the threats around the world, um, take a recent example of what happened in Ukraine. Now, you may say, well, what's Ukraine got to do with us? But we're part of NATO. It's very important that we are part of NATO because it's essential to our security, created after the end of the Second World War. And when... Uh, it all kicked off in Ukraine. The fact that Europe, the European Union as an entity came together and said, well, we thoroughly disapprove of what uh, Russia has done, and we agreed sanctions against Russia, which are fighting on Russia. The conflict there is not over, but it's frozen in some way. And I made a speech recently in which I said, President Putin would not shed a tear if... Britain were to vote to leave the European Union because he would regard that as a greater strength for Russia and greater weakness for Europe. And an important part of our defence is not just our military forces that we rely on and value and appreciate, it is also the strength that we can bring internationally to the councils of the world, the United Nations, we're a permanent member of the Security Council, um, our role in Europe. And the fact that Europe speaks with one voice strengthens Britain's voice in the world. You know, there are people who argue in this referendum, ah, oh, well, somehow we've, we've lost sovereignty, we've lost our influence. They could not be more wrong. We have chosen, as a nation, to work with others in our mutual interest. The fact that we are part of the largest single market in the world, 500 million consumers. Take a really practical example. Every day we export from Britain nearly 2,000 cars <coughs> to Europe. Now, you think of the history of the British motor vehicle industry, there were those who said, well, it was in decline, well, cars were going to be made somewhere else in the world. Well, it's now recovering. Why? Because we're in the European Union. Think of the investment that has come in here from companies like BMW making the Mini, Toyota and Honda, 
Look at the Nissan factory up in Washington in the northeast. People understand that being part of this market is good it's for jobs, investment and growth. When America and Japan try and sell cars to Europe, they have to pay a 10% tariff. Now the challenge to those who are arguing not for in, but for out, for leave, is very simply this. If we left, answer this very simple question, what would our trading relationships with Europe be like? And the debate so far has shown that those who are advocating we leave cannot answer the question. And there's a very simple reason why they can't answer it. Because they didn't, we wouldn't be in control of the process. It would be up to the European Union to decide what term. Now, we have one or two examples. In the case of Norway, which is not in the European Union, they do have access to the single market, but on these terms. They have to pay a contribution, which is almost the same per head of population as the UK. They have to accept all of the rules relating to the single market. They have to accept the union to workers. And the only difference is they get no say over what the rules are. And that's why the Norwegian Prime Minister has said, I really wouldn't do that if I were you, because isn't it better to be in the club making the rules than outside the club having to observe the rules? So that's, that's one option. Um, but if you didn't have access to the single market, well then, on what terms would we sell our goods? And also trade our services. We mustn't forget that we are really strong in services, insurance, finance, lots of other services as a nation. And this is, this is not a sort of um, a choice with no consequence. The fact is, there could be a real economic impact. And it's not, I'm not standing here saying Britain couldn't survive outside the European Union. The argument is, we are better off in. We have a better chance of growth, investment and jobs. If we remain, and if you've seen the papers today, Taking another example, Stephen Hawking, uh, that wonderful scientist, together with 150 other top scientists, has said, very simply, leaving the European Union would be a disaster for British science. Because he talks about the flow of money. British universities and British science is very successful in getting funding from Europe, as has Ocean Studios been successful in getting the grants to build um, this wonderful facility inside the historic walls that we are meeting in today. And also, it's the flow of people bringing in those of talent, working with people of talent in other countries, that gives British science the great reputation that it has got. And we have lots of other advantages as a country. So it matters from that point of view. Secondly, on security, as well as the, the global issues I talked about, and another I would mention is, is climate change. People may think, well, how's that going to affect us? But believe you me, I was for nearly four years the International Development Secretary, and when you meet people who have had to flee the village in which they were born and grew up because it has stopped raining, human beings will do what human beings have done throughout human history. If you can't live where you are now, you're going to move somewhere else. And therefore tackling climate change is in all of our interests. And I know because I led the British delegation to the 2007 Global Climate Talks in Bali, the fact that the European Union comes as a group of nations and says, this is the offer we're prepared to put on the table is immensely powerful, rather than 28 nations coming and saying, I might do this, well, I could do a bit of that. Because if you're going to tackle climate change, you have to go around the room and say, if we're going to get our emissions down to reduce temperature increase, I need to know from you what you can offer. You're American for the purposes of this example, and, and you're the European Union, and you're China, and you're India, and you're New Zealand, and you're Australia, and you're Zambia, or South Africa. And I've seen with my own eyes the difference that speaking with one voice can bring. Take another practical example. Physical security, we have this thing called the European Arrest Warrant. And it means that unlike the old days where people could commit crimes in Britain, flee to the elsewhere in Europe, and hope that a long legal process and tying it up in knots and there being no extradition treaty might mean that they would never have to return to Britain to face justice, we now have the European Arrest Warrant. And in 2005, you remember, of course, the terrible London bombings of 7-7. Remember what happened two weeks later? The second attempt to blow up Londoners, which failed mercifully because their bombs didn't go off. One of the guys who did it fled to Rome. The European arrest warrant brought him back. He was charged. He was tried. He was convicted. He's serving a term of imprisonment because we're working with our European neighbours to ensure justice. 
And on the other hand, we have returned to other countries, getting on for 7,000 people, thanks to the arrest warrant, so they can face justice in their own country for crimes it is alleged that they have uh, committed. And that is really important too. And the last point I would make, because I want to uh, have time for questions and, and discussion, is about the rights and the benefits that Europe has brought us. The most uh, practical ones, from next year when we go to Europe, if we go to Europe on our holes, we won't pay extortionate roaming charges when we use this. Why? Because Europe has worked together to get rid of the roaming charges. When we go down to the beaches, um, because of the bathing waters directive, as it was called, if we want clean beaches in Europe, we have to deal with the sewage that comes off the coast of Devon and Cornwall. We also have to do, deal with the sewage that comes off the coast of northern France. You can't, if you don't deal with both, you're going to have a problem. Workers' rights, something we feel passionately about in the, in the Labour movement, Paid holiday. Everyone in this country got an entitlement to paid holiday because we were members of the European Union. It did not exist before. Why have we got improved maternity and paternity leave to spend time with new baby when he or she is born? Better rights for agency and temporary workers, the working time directive. Now, some of the answers say, oh, all this bureaucracy and red tape in Europe. One of them, Chris Grayling, was on the telly recently and the interviewer said, well, what kind of red tape do you mean? He said, health and safety. What is health and safety legislation? It protects you and me when we go to work, so we're not injured. So we've got a safe working environment. That's not bureaucracy. That is a basic right, which is really important. And to make a party political point, if we left, we will, we will wake up the following morning to find we have a Conservative government, no longer constrained by the rights that are applied to citizens right across Europe, a floor of rights that prevents a race to the bottom, they can do what they like. And history has taught us, well, they've done that in the past. So, for all of those reasons, I think it makes sense for us to remain in the European Union. It's going to be a lot of debate, there's going to be a, a lot of uh, argument. People say, I want more facts. But in the end, it comes back to that essential argument, what it's done for jobs, and that's really important, Encouraging investment, growth in the economy, being confident about our place in the world. Because I'm really confident about Britain, this wonderful country of ours, what we've got to offer. And we can do that, working with our European neighbours and others, trading around the world, which we do because Europe has negotiated 53 trade deals with other countries. And that gives us a stronger voice in the world. It means we have a stronger economy. In the end, it's going to be better for our society. But on the question of the uh, deterrent, uh, the nuclear deterrent, we in the Labour Party are having a uh, review at the moment, but since you asked me, I will tell you what my view is. I want to see a world in which there are no nuclear weapons. We all do. I don't think there's anyone in the room who would want them uh, for themselves. The question is, how do you get there? Do you do that by taking unilateral action, or do you do so by international negotiation, coming back to the question that was asked uh, by you earlier. And I think the truth is this, if we gave up our nuclear deterrent, I don't think any of the other nuclear states in the world would give theirs up. So you wouldn't advance the cause of uh, multilateral nuclear uh, disarmament, firstly. Secondly, I believe the deterrent has kept peace. And the purpose of it is to deter a potential aggressor. It's, it's not to use it, it's so that you don't have to use it, because they think hmm, it's not worth taking the risk. Thirdly, the, you know, the world out there changes all the time, and those arguing for uh, abandoning our nuclear deterrent, I would say, would need to be pretty certain about what the risks might be in 10, 20, 30, 40 years' time. Now, I can't tell you what they may be. The final point I would make is, hands up if you would feel very comfortable about living in a world in which... Every nation had given up their nuclear weapons apart from North Korea. Diplomacy. Clearly, if you can, the best thing you can do is to prevent a conflict in the first place by means of diplomacy. Now, Europe also played an influential role in the agreement with Iran over the nuclear issue. Now, why was Iran called to account? Because it had signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and it was felt... Uh, potentially to be in breach of the commitments it had given, and Europe, originally Cathay Ashton, was the, uh, uh, the
the lead person on European foreign affairs, and then Federica Mogherini, who took over in the latter stages. There's another example. Uh, the money that we and other countries give to support refugees in the region in Syria, well, that is helping those countries, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey. Turkey, 2.7 million people is taken. Lebanon's population has increased by 25%. Now, that is like 16 million people turning out to live in the United Kingdom. The reason I'm supporting in is because uh, the European Union has been really good to Plymouth and really good for Plymouth. Um, we've had a number of programmes going back over 25 years, starting with the Renaval programme, um, which has supported a regeneration in a lot of Plymouth uh, down the years. Um, now more than ever, we still need that support from the European Union. And if we cut ourselves off, we're cutting our nose off despite our face. You look around Plymouth, you look around the skyline of Plymouth, and the number of projects that have had European funding in it. Plymouth would not be the place it is today if it weren't for the European Union. <coughs>